and wait. But I'm here. So usually I just use like a generic creamer in here with cinnamon and sugar, but today I use this creamer uh, with cinnamon and sugar. So it's going to be like a chocolate cinnamon swirl kind of thing. I hope everybody likes it. <clears throat> it smells delicious, that's for sure. done. <clears throat> Today the Lord wants me to give him a verse from Psalms 109, so I shall. I think he wants me to give him verse 1 and 2. So all of the show with church things was purely a show. That was part of Mark's game plan. The recently discovered letter is additional confirmation of the Book of Mormon. This letter was... You can only envision Mark listening to a general authority standing at the pulpit, declaring one of his documents that he's forged to be proof of the Book of Mormon's authenticity. I can only imagine the smile he had on his face watching this because this was complete validation for him of what he was doing. When the investigation started unraveling the duplicity of Mark and showing how he had fooled the men looked to as prophesiers and revelators that one assumed would have special divine direction that Mark was a crook, and yet they didn't get that. The theological response to that is that God gives people the agency to choose between right and wrong, and as an omniscient being who himself knows all of this, he doesn't step in and interfere. The idea being that universal detection of crimes or sins would revoke the agency God has given to each of his children to make their own decisions. History is confusing enough dealing with real documents and then you throw in somebody that may be throwing in some uh, fraudulent ones and it just makes it that much harder to figure out what happened. According to experts like Tanner, some of the documents will require a reevaluation of the entire history of the Mormon Church. So the fallout from Mark Hoffman's documents was a great questioning in the community about the very basis of their faith. Or unto you. People tend to ignore anything that does not fit within their own beliefs. They reject the facts because it means giving up their beliefs for which they've sacrificed so much. I wouldn't go as far to say I wanted to change Mormon history. Let me take that back. Uh, maybe I did. To cast doubt on the integrity of this work. To take the historical narrative of an entire institution... Hoffman says he originally considered using a common toad as the magical character, but he said he made it a white salamander because, quote, I decided to spice it up. He's the one who's pulling the strings. He was going to be determining what Mormon history was. Mark Hoffman's most famous discovery, the salamander letter, 
was a document that he forged for purpose. That purpose was not only to acquire the $40,000 for which he ultimately sold it to Steve Christensen. The real ultimate purpose of that was to serve as the comparison for his masterpiece if he had been allowed to forge long enough to create it. And that was the 116 lost pages of the original Book of Mormon manuscript. You have the salamander letter that's in Harris's handwriting. That lays the groundwork for a lost document, the 116 pages, that's also in Martin Harris's handwriting. So he's going to match the handwritings right across the board so that one forgery authenticates another. My guess is he probably would have asked for 10 or 20 million as a starter, but certainly a seven or eight digit figure. Hoffman had no respect for history, especially documents dealing with the history of the church. I didn't really question them for a while because I figured they've been examined by the best in the business, you know? Mr. Hoffman, I've read um, a great deal of information about the forgeries. I was, uh, I was quite affected by the sophistication that was involved there. There's been a lot of stories to the effect that, you know, I was some sort of a genius forger or something, which I don't think is accurate. I think that to make themselves look like the experts they are, uh, they have to try to build me up since I uh, fooled them. Mark Hoffman has a characteristic manner of forging documents. That's what made him so great, if you want to say he's great, was his versatility. Uh, he would tackle papers, documents, letters, books, printing machines, money, you name it, he would go for it. Although I don't really consider myself an artistic person, I think I have the ability to look at handwriting and copy it. When I finally decided to sit down and write it, I would have composed it and forged it all within a day or two. One of the things that happens with old documents is that there's a phenomenon called foxing. It refers to the fact that these very acidic iron galatanate inks burn through the paper over time. So to create the illusion, that would mean finding some way to pull the ink through to the back of the document. It would have been aged on a metal screen with suction pulling down from the front of the document to the back with an old vacuum cleaner. The purpose is to bring the brand of the ink through to the back side. He did some other things that were almost unbelievable. This was a simple apparatus, a five gallon aquarium, a piece of glass is covering the top of it. A plug goes into a 110 volt outlet. One of the pieces of wire is going into the aquarium. The other is going into a jar filled with water and salt. The spark in the oxygen atmosphere forms ozone, and the ozone comes in contact with the paper. It would make the documents appear that they had environmental damage consistent with a document that was 150 years old. As far as the ink, this was just a simple recipe consisting of tannic acid, ferric sulfate, and gum arabic. I bought them from hobby shops. Why did that cracking occur? It doesn't occur in natural aging, so what was it in the Hoffman documents that caused that ink to crack? Bill would make the ink and send it to me, and I would go through using different chemicals on them until we could duplicate the formula Mark Hoffman may have used. So the question then, from a scientific standpoint, is how did Mark speed up oxidation unnaturally that caused that ink to crack? You can speed up oxidation with heat, or you can speed up oxidation chemically. I put the documents under the microscope and watched as they dried, and they would form this cracking, alligatoring pattern in exactly the same way it appeared on the Hoffman documents. It was like a, a eureka moment. It was nirvana, actually. These are experts who are quite schooled. 
and that by making them appear to be not so smart, you make yourself appear to look smarter than, than the rest of them. I guess looking back on it, uh, I'm proud of some of the techniques that I developed. summer of 1985, I think that, that Mark came over like he was doing very well and being very successful at what he was doing. I knew that he had high stake items. It was not just living the high life, but living a life of high risk. He was on a quest for the gold and silver. He was looking for the riches. And this was his way of doing it. Um, in terms of your employment, you are a dealer in antiques, particularly historic documents. You listed your salary uh, during your peak years as being in six figures. Uh, what happened to all that money? I traveled quite a bit. I bought a lot of things. Easy come, easy go. He would like to take people out to dinner and he'd go to expensive places and I didn't like seeing our money go out the window when we could use it for our family. What do you have down there, darling? Our little baby, Karen. Here we are in the recovery room. Yeah. And at this time we had three children and so we needed to go get a van. While we were there, Mark said, oh, I like that sports car. Oh, wow. And we came home with a van and a sports car. was your salary exclusive of the forgeries? Uh, they were so intertwined that that's hard to say. Basically, the only reason why I would buy or sell genuine documents was as a cover. Uh, so, I'm sitting here trying to knit. I've messed up a few times, so I had to begin from the beginning. But... The cast on is the easiest for me so far. What? Unfortunately, when I do the knitting stitch, I need to have it looser. And because this yarn is very tight, I have to put two needles in when I do the cast on, pull one needle out, and then do the knitting. We need to win. I finally have my glasses on because I couldn't see on after the third stitch for the knitting. Now I should be able to see. Let's see how well I do. I'm so excited. I got the cast on good. Look at that. Some nice cast on. And I like this color. Isn't it a nice color? Good to practice with. <laughs> 